So I'm going to go into Photoshop and um, yeah, see how fast it runs. It normally takes. <laughs> <laughs> it opened in less than a second. I've never seen that before. Oh my God. They look unassuming, but these two laptops change two major things that we think about laptops. One, computing power, and two, battery power. And it's all thanks to what's inside, Apple's new M1 chip. G'day, you're watching Tech Finder. As always, links to everything we talk about are in the description below. And hey, if this video was informative or useful to you, throw us a like when we're done. The M1 chip is a system on a chip, which basically replaces the Intel processor and graphics cards found in pretty much every Apple computer up until now. It means that Apple has full control over software and hardware and how it interacts, allowing them to make a much more efficient computer. They've been doing a similar thing in their iPhones and iPads for years. This is just on a bigger scale. If you want more info on the chip and what it means from a technical perspective, there are people who are far more qualified than me who go into great detail about it. I've left some links in the description. What do these laptops mean for users like you and me though? Well, let's start with computing power. It's ridiculous. Both laptops are essentially the same inside. The Pro just has a few extra bells and whistles and most importantly, a fan, so it can run at peak performance for longer. But as you can see from the average Geekbench scores, they're pretty much the same. So I'll be reviewing both at the same time in this video. What these Geekbench scores also show, both laptops have outclassed pretty much anything Apple's done before besides the super expensive iMacs and Mac Pros. Remember, these are basically Apple's cheapest laptops and they're holding their own against Apple's most expensive desktops. That's pretty wild. In my own real world testing, I use the intensive apps that I use every day, which is video editing and photography stuff, and I was pretty impressed. The M1 version of Photoshop opened super fast and didn't miss a beat when I was editing complex images. Same goes for video editing on Premiere Pro. I was blown away at how easily it just plays back heavy 4K footage. Even my ridiculously expensive PC slows down on that sometimes. Oh, and just for fun, here's what happens when you run the most intensive program of them all, Google Chrome with 100 tabs open. So Chrome kind of broke, but I could still use other apps like Safari just fine. <laughs> so when I was just using this as a general laptop for sensibly surfing the web and doing stuff like word processing, watching videos, playing music, there were no issues whatsoever. It was fast, snappy, the laptop never got hot, and the Pro never even kicked its fans up. Oh, also, I figured Apple had given me the highest spec version of the MacBook Pro with 16 gigs of RAM rather than 8, but nope, I checked. It's the 8 gig of RAM version. That's less RAM than my phone, and it's comfortably running all of these desktop apps. There is one slight catch. Because the M1 chip is so new, there are a lot of apps that are not fully optimized for it yet. Fortunately, Apple have thought of this, and they've included Rosetta 2, which basically helps run those apps. Thankfully, even apps running on Rosetta 2 seem to work as well as they do on an old Intel Mac or PC, so there's not a whole lot to worry about there. If there is an older or more obscure app that you use for work or personal projects, I would recommend going to isapplesiliconready.com to check if your app actually works at all. Speaking of optimized apps, a cool side effect of this Apple chip is that iOS apps work on your computer now, and you can, in theory, use them on your desktop. I was excited to try this out, but it's not that good yet. It's opt-in for iOS developers, so a lot of apps just aren't here, including stuff like Instagram, which would have been nice. Also, the experience with each app that is present is a bit hit or miss. Some just straight up do not work properly without having that touch interface. Still, it's a cool feature and I look forward to seeing it get better over time, hopefully. Another piece of the MacBook that apparently benefits from the M1 chip is the webcam. Um, this is it, it's the 720p FaceTime webcam, which is getting pretty dated now. Apparently the chip helps with improved noise reduction, greater dynamic range, improved auto white balance, and machine learning enhanced face detection. But what do you reckon? Um, I don't think this is great still. As for the microphones, they're serviceable, like you're listening to them right now and they're fine. But if you're wanting to go for the perfect zoom call, you're probably going to look at investing in a webcam and something like a headset with a microphone. This is my favorite part though, the battery life. They're not bigger batteries, they are just so much more efficient. For the first week or so I had these machines, I used them maybe one or two hours a day, just mucking around with Safari, watching shows, playing some Apple Arcade games, and keeping them on sleep mode when not in use. I didn't even have to think about charging for that week. They also barely consume any power when closed, so you don't really need to worry about draining the battery that way unless you leave it closed for weeks. I can't test that though, I have to give them back. 
I've seen various tests around the web that try to replicate Apple's claim of 20 hours of uninterrupted watch time on the Pro and 18 hours of uninterrupted watch time on the Air, but most seem to go closer to 16 and 14 respectively, which is still very good. It still means that this MacBook Pro has the best battery in a MacBook ever, and the Air is not that far behind. So that's all the cool new stuff. Let's talk old. If you've ever seen an Apple laptop before, there's nothing new to see here. It's the usual clean aluminium looking design Apple have been using for years now. And hey, I think it works. If you say the word laptop, this is the design that most people think of. And for good reason, almost everything here is great. Why change a good thing? If you were put off MacBooks over the past five years because of the butterfly keyboard, don't worry, it's gone. A little while ago, Apple switched to what they call the magic keyboard, which I find quite nice to type on. It's not magic though, it's just a fine keyboard that doesn't break all the time. If you buy the Pro, you also get your top row of keys replaced with the context sensitive touch bar, which works totally fine, but I wouldn't say is a must have accessory. And both also have a fingerprint reader inside the power button, which I've enjoyed using to skip password entry. The screen on both is that classic beautiful Apple Retina display screen, but the Pro version is slightly brighter. Apple screens are bright and I find the colors to be pretty perfect as well. And it's no different on these two laptops great display. Um, I could also say the same for the trackpads. I love Apple's trackpads. And again, I think they're some of the best in the biz. They brought them over to these laptops as well. I also love that both of these laptops charge via USB-C, which is great if all of your other devices are USB-C as well. Just remember to pack the specific Mac charger because you'll need that brick to inject enough power into them. So for example, you won't be able to charge either of these using something like a power bank for your phone. It just does not put out enough energy. And while I love USB-C ports, this is actually where the laptops are most disappointing. There's only two of them. Yep, both only have two Thunderbolt 3 slash USB 4 ports, and they're only on the left-hand side. The right-hand side gets a single 3.5 millimeter jack. I don't think that's enough ports at all, especially when you consider they're also used for charging. Yes, I know you can get dongles and that might solve most people's problems, but you can lose those and they do have their limits. For now, I'll leave it at two ports is not enough, but I want to go into more detail on that in the Pro versus Air, which one should you buy video, which is coming out soon. So make sure to hit subscribe if you want to know when that one drops. Um, lots of spicy opinions coming in that video. Now, just a quick shout out before I give you my final recommendations. If you need a second opinion, I highly recommend going to finder.com and reading Alex Kidman's reviews of both the Air and the Pro. He reviewed them separately. He has slightly different thoughts to me, so worth checking that out if you want a second opinion. Links to those are in the description. And also, if you decide that these laptops are for you, there are links to purchase those in the description as well. I think these are well worth picking up. Let me elaborate. If you're in need of a small, lightweight laptop that can do everything you need, I cannot recommend these laptops enough right now. The battery seems to just last forever and everything just works so quickly and seamlessly. Surfing the web and watching videos is a breeze, but once you start delving into creative programs like Photoshop and video editing tools, it just feels game changing to be getting those speeds on a device this size. Once you factor in that iconic Apple design with the beautiful screen, the really good trackpad, and the functional keyboard, um, yeah, these are some of the best laptops I've used in their price range to date. It's a shame about this webcam though. The fact that these only have two ports is really putting me off wanting to purchase one as a sole personal computer, but if I was in the market for a laptop that I just needed to throw stuff at and know I could rely on it, I would be picking up one of these M1 MacBooks in a heartbeat. But which one should you buy? Well, uh, I actually had to make a second video about this because it turns out I have a lot of thoughts on the subject. Um, so hit subscribe to know when that video comes out if you need more help deciding. Also, I didn't mention the M1 Mac Mini, which is the desktop version of these computers. Now, I actually used it to edit this entire video uh, just to see what the workflow was like. I documented the entire thing. So if you're interested in seeing how an M1 Mac can be applied to a real world situation, definitely hit subscribe because you'll be able to see that too. Two very good reasons to subscribe coming up. So uh, yeah, hopefully I'll see you there.